share the screen. All right, hello everyone. Let me start sharing my screen really quickly. So welcome to the um, um, Post Def Con Pacific Hackers meeting. Yes, yeah, so the post, you know, it, it was a long week last week. So, how, how many, by show of hands, how many people went to Def Con? Oh, okay. Well, you know how I feel, right? You know, how pretty much everybody feels. It, it was long, it was, uh, it was great. And there's a lot to talk about Def Con, and there's a lot to talk about Pacific Hackers and, and, and where we're going from here. Marco, if you're presenting something, we're not seeing it. Uh, well, I wasn't there. Okay. There you go. Okay, cool. All right. So, so, and can you see my, 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 yes. I see the meetup one. Okay. Good. One you want to show? Yep, okay. Yep, yep. All right. So, um, so obviously if, if you're here is because you somehow find that through meetup, I, at least I, that's what I ask, uh, some people. So this is our meetup page. So this is where we post events every month. And that's how you keep track of what we're currently doing as far as the community wise, right? Um, so this, this month we, you know, happen to have a great topic and a great presenter. I'm gonna introduce her in a little bit, um, but let's talk about uh, who we are. So I see a lot of new people. In fact, half of the room, you probably won't see them, but half, pretty much 80% of the people yeah, you can turn around if you want. <laughs> Pretty much everybody in the room is it's new. And that's great because we want to have that exposure. We, you know, we want to show you what we're doing so you can tell others and you know invite them, right? So first things first, you know, you see our new um actually you uh, can you turn to the uh the standee, please? We have two new standees as you were coming in through the doors. We have a standee there that talks about our nonprofit. And also it talks, you know, the other stand here talks about the uh, uh, the meetup. So long story short, and since everybody's new here, how we started, we started the Pacific Hikers meetup about five, six years ago. And it was just meeting like this every month, talking about, um, you know, security related stuff, uh, playing CTFs and so on. Uh, but we were starting helping people to get into jobs and, you know, and so on. So we got to the point where a person say, well, why you don't do it at the bigger level? And I say, oh, why not? And uh, how do we do that? The, and the best way to do it obviously was as a nonprofit. So pacifichackers.org became a nonprofit um, exactly on August 1st of last year. And that's when we started actually doing, you know, you know helping more people and, and stuff like that. And that's basically who, what we what we do now. So now, besides having the meetup, besides having the conference, which I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, we have an organization who is helping. The mission of this organization is number one: diversify the cybersecurity industry. Number two, we want to um, uh, fix the uh, the school system. So the school system, as you probably know or seen, uh, they're not teaching the correct stuff. So when they graduate. They, they don't they're not really ready to go to the workforce so we want to show them what they really need to know in order to get a job number three is um fixing the hr system uh it's very insane when they you know you see the job post saying i want a junior analyst with a cissp well you know in order to get a cissp you need five years of experience in the field so that's insane so what we're trying to do here is make direct connections so far we already place people uh, from different backgrounds into the workforce, one at NASA, one into um, Intel, another one into a, uh, a consulting company as a penetration tester. And again, uh, I actually was one of uh, uh, how I got my job you know, a few years ago is I was giving a presentation on this same place and, and, and my, uh, my manager was there. And my presentation was my, my pretty much my, uh, my ticket to you know, to, to the job. That was my interview. So that was on a Sunday and by Friday I was hired. So that tells you that meetups like this are very important because your potential manager, your potential coworker are already here and that you just have to make the connection. So we need attendance. A lot of people choose to go um, uh, hybrid because obviously COVID and I, we really understand that. But we also see that, and especially at DEFCON that we need, um, 
you know, the in-person, uh, you know, touch, because that's just, that's not going away, okay? So, um, so number, well, so I'm, I'm just showing you here the pacifichackers.org. We have a donation page. Uh, we're still obviously working on it. In fact, we're gonna launch the, uh, um, the new page in a few weeks. Um, but here's one thing, sometimes it's not about just money, how you can help us. It's again, spreading the word. Um, telling people about what we're teaching here, what we're trying to do here, and you know, kind of you know, go from there, right? So moving on, uh, Pacific Hackers Conference, it is happening, and it is happening here at Hacker Doyle. So it's happening November 18 and 19. So in November 19, 18, it's all um, uh, trainings. So if there is two trainings, and actually, let me see. So there's going to be two trainings, the yeah, open source intelligence training and the enterprise and penetration testing. If you're looking to learn any of those, uh, um, you know, uh, topics, you know, Razor, we're actually going to open registrations uh, this Monday. So uh, just look into that. R believe it or not, uh, the, on the event right, there's the, uh, the event for November 18, and 19, there's already, we already sold tickets. And we, we haven't even post, uh, you know, content or who's presenting or anything like that. But because we did this like in 2018 and 2019 and it was successful, you know, people want this back. So that's why uh, we, it was a last minute decision. We took last month and say, you know what? I don't know how it's gonna be. Let's just uh, bring back the, uh, the conference. And so it's happening this year. So that's another great thing that's happening um and again uh rod is going to be talking about it and we have another presenter she just gave a talk at the red team village at defcon her name is sandra and also um you know she's been in other places uh, she has her own company and that's what she does uh open source investigations for law enforcement she trains law enforcement military and stuff like that so you're interested in that you know you can you know you can go there um if you can make it and you miss the zoom well, we have the uh, Pacific Hackers uh, uh, YouTube page. This is where all our you know videos are, and you've probably seen some familiar faces like this guy right here and this guy right here, and and probably some other people. Yeah, oh, here you go. That's another um, star right here. Uh, well, so before uh, the pandemic, we were not recording our videos uh, because for us it was very important to have that in person. Obviously, COVID came up, and we didn't. We never stopped. We continue and to make it accessible to everyone. And, and that's when we actually start uh, creating Zoom sessions and uh, you know inviting and getting more people. So that was a good thing. The community never ended. COVID did not stop us. And that was a great thing. Uh, that's just telling us that people are willing to learn and willing to share knowledge and everything else. Um, so that's great, right? So. Um, what we're trying to accomplish here, and, and this is where I'm moving with the DEF CON thing, is a few things. So a couple of weeks ago, we um, we had a CTF, free DEF CON CTF, and the winner of the CTF uh, won a, a badge to DEF CON. So these are the, also the type of things that we do. And in fact, I have the, uh, the picture right here. So Alex, congratulations. So we, uh, we uh, um, you know, Alex won the first place on our CTF, and and he won a. a well, you know, but you did it. Uh, the the point here is that we want pe more people like Alex to come and 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 well, first of all, share the knowledge and and also prove yourself. And why not win something? Because this was just our CTF, but then. Um, if I just go back here to other things, we won first place at the Rare Alert CTF at DEF CON. And, and this was huge because two, two teams from Pacific Hackers and Hack Miami got together. Um, we have uh, a member here. In fact, you, oh, you were not on this picture because, well, but I took, the picture on, on his behalf okay so i i helped him a, a little bit you know uh but they did all the job but here are some of the pictures um this again this this team was formed out of you know people who randomly met we just like 
the people in Miami obviously have never been here. And have you been Miami? Probably not. So they met at DEF CON, right? And then from there they say, well, let's form a team, let's play ACTF. They were not sure which one. They just picked one. It was a red alert. And, and, and here you go. We, uh, we won first place. As you can see, here are the uh, team XX. Won uh, by 22,050. Uh, points where, where the other ones were still on you know below 2000 uh, and that was great that was um you know a great accomplishment in fact i think i have the uh the pictures from the event let me check i think it's in another tweet yeah uh, I, I i just downloaded them so here we were already in stage uh and um and that was actually a very great experience um because you know, that, that's the showcase we want to show, right? We want to tell people that by coming here, you learn something. And then when you go to DEF CON, whether you win in a CTF or not, going to DEF CON, form a team, and then you can represent us, right? So, um, yeah, uh, let's see what else. Um, anything else, Rod, that I'm missing? Uh, oh, wait, he's actually the actual video. I don't know if he's gonna- It's, uh, it's, it's Max there. Max is here. Uh, you want to talk about it, Max? Yeah, I like to. I like everybody to to clap for Max. Max okay, is our hero. Okay, come here, Max. All right. Yeah, so um, here, here's the camera. Please, please, uh, the bug. Here, here, come here. Hey, Hi, Max. Actually, how are you? Without this guy, we would not have won. Like this dude cracked a, a fighting oracle challenge in a day and a half. So. Um, yeah. Please, everybody, that give a lot of fun. Of for that Max. And that's his, uh, that's his uh, price, right? Yeah. So I, I want, since he was in, wasn't there, uh, what I want to yeah. do is I want to present because I took his, uh, uh, please, the uh, the gift on his behalf. But this is what the, he he won. He won an uh, ICS uh, kit and uh, apparently a pen and something, you know, whatever. I, I give him oh. the coin to Phil and then he's gonna give it to you so you can take pictures with it. Max, thank you very much. Right. Awesome. Congratulations, yeah. man. Thank Here you. you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And we can pull this apart. All right. Oh, wait, we have to let... wait. No, that... <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So I didn't mention there's a story with this. So there, there was an actual show in in DefCon where with drummers and everything, and they were giving giving out um, um, you know this this work. So this became very fun. Uh, I got stopped by security many times because they thought it was uh, real. So I just had it like right here, and I was wearing a, a hat and a cape. And uh, and basically, they told me you have to put that in room, your room and stuff like that. And uh, to the point where, like, I just went here. It's it's not real. And uh, yeah, they left me alone. But that was uh, the story of, of of this. So here you go. So and I'm it's here for anyone. <laughs> um, oh, last but not least. So we release. Um, so in your desk, we have some flyers. We have the flyers for the, um, you know, one side, the nonprofit, the other one is uh, for call for papers. If you're interested in to, uh, being a speaker at Pacific Hackers Conference, uh, please, please submit your talks. We want the local audience to, to get your, you know, known. We have many people now, celebrities in the cybersecurity industry who went through Pacific Hackers Conference one and two, and now they're in bigger venues. Um, we want the same for you guys. So. So we we'll also CFP a for training, Michael. But, but say that again. CFP for training too. If you have an amazing training. Oh yeah, can, um, yeah, yeah. Like I mentioned, we have two um, trainings right now. But if you have a training that, who knows? Like you, you might want to present. Hey, might as well uh, make some money and um, and again, please let us know. Um, and that'll be that'll be cool. Um, so there's stickers. Uh, but also, uh, we um, we have two T-shirts that we actually uh, selling to raise money for the nonprofit. So I'm just gonna show it right here. So this is the first one, the one I'm wearing, and a lot of people are wearing. This is the Pacific Hackers one, uh, the nonprofit. Uh, and let me see. This is the uh, the conference one. 
So it's one for 25, two for 40. Uh, if you're interested, we have uh, uh, we have t-shirts here and uh, and yeah, otherwise, um, I think it's time for me to present a uh, awesome presenter and an awesome topic. So you probably hear about the flipper zero. Uh, well, I guess you can do a lot of things. There's one in the back, there you go. Uh, there's, um, you can do many things with Flipper Zero, and um, I'm just going to let uh, uh, Caitlin introduce uh, her topic, but so she's been part of Pacific Hackers for, for many years. She's been giving talks about, you know, satellite hacking, you know, uh, hardware hacking and stuff like that, and, you know, uh, without anything else, I'll just let you uh, so I'm going to turn off my, my camera right now. Uh, we're going to switch computers, but um, yeah. So Caitlin, come come over. Woo. Okay, we can I am un. You'll have to mute. Okay, and then I'm going to unmute. Oh no! Oh, I'm unmuted. Okay, perfect. Start video. Click on, click on the arrow first because that might. Yeah. Be Oh my goodness. Okay, it works. Awesome. Oh, this is absolutely amazing. <laughs> we, we are a technology expert. Um, <laughs> all right, let me pull up the PowerPoint and I'll check out the chat. Looks like we have a few chat things. Ooh, see, see if, uh, calls for papers. Excellent. Yes, we can always use more calls for papers. Um, let me bring up my PowerPoint. Um, and I am so afraid if I go into like presenter mode, it's going to do some weird things since it sees me connected to another monitor, but we'll see what happens. Uh, let's see if we go to share screen, screen, share. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna try to present, uh, which I can't even see. Um, view, oh, slideshow from the beginning, come on. Oh, it's working. Okay. Oh, wow. That's cool. I was not expecting that. I love it when things work. All right. So, uh, where did this talk come from? Uh, so, some people got uh, the Flipper Zero. Um, I don't know if, uh, you know, everyone is familiar with what this is, but it, it was a small little project to build the sort of Tamagotchi RF hacking device. And people got the Flipper Zero and they're like, this is cool. Uh, what, what can I do with it? Uh, um, and so, <laughs> Uh, I, I previously was working at NASA, um, and now I am working at Amazon doing device work. Uh, and one of my big fields of study is RF technology, which is exactly what the Flipper Zero is, is doing. Uh, so what I'm hoping to do is give people an understanding of, you know, the capabilities of the Flipper and, and what the different, you know, functions it provides, you know, are doing um, at a very fundamental level, as well as give some Practical example. Uh, so this talk is going to be a largely sort of like a science lecture. I would rather do like a, a CTF, but because I would have to give everyone all this equipment, <laughs> that's not going to happen. So um, let's see. So once again, my name is Caitlin Hamilton, and I'm glad to be here. And we're going to start off by looking at the infrared sensor, which is, you can see it on the camera, which is this big black square thing here and you may have seen this on like remote controls and stuff before and we're going to do a bit of a deep dive into what's going on here because it's actually kind of interesting so infrared light is light that you can that just before visible spectrum so if you look at the spectrum um, of like the rainbow you'll see at the lower end lower wavelength of visible light you have red and that goes all the way up to our friend roy g bib roy g bib um 
Uh, but, at, but below the visible spectrum, there's something called infrared or like below red. Um, and that's where these transmitters come in. They're basically shooting light in that spectrum. And if we look at a simple infrared transmitter that you would hook up to like an Arduino or something, it's very simple, ridiculously simple. Three pins, one's power, one's ground, one's data. It blinks an LED on and off. That's all it does. Um, and then if you look at the receiver, it almost looks deceptively just as simple. But we're going to find out in a second it's not, actually. So you have the same three pins. So what you send to one device, you sort of read back on the other. Uh, but you have this like black sort of, uh, I'm going to say transistor looking thing here uh, called the IR receiver. Um, and if we go and look around for this part, we see that it is an yeah, IR receiver diode has three legs, looks a lot like a transistor. Now, most diodes have two legs. This has three, what's going on? Um, I went to the data sheet and it was actually kind of interesting. Um, so I initially thought this would just be like a, a light sensor, like a photodiode, but it's not. Um, and unfortunately, uh, Zoom is kind of covering things up here. But um, if you look at the diagram here, you can see that there's actual signal processing going on. Uh, so what happens is that you get the infrared light going in, actually has a control circuit, which I'm pretty sure is doing a phase lock loop of some kind. Uh, the AGC is automatic gain control, which is oftentimes employed right before it, uh, a radio does some sort of AM amplitude modulation decoding. Um, and then, yeah, it demodulates the AM signal um, and then sends it back through a transistor, essentially, which, you know, blinks the data signal. So it's not just, it sees lights, therefore it turns on. There's actually data you know, processing going on in uh, these modules. Uh, and I have some of these modules set up to go. So, um, right, so yeah, so uh, this module, the IR frequency, is running at about 38 kilohertz. That's usually what we see in these IR remotes, about 38 kilohertz. Uh, although you can find IR transceivers and receivers running on a few other different frequencies, like 30, uh, you know, 40, 56, uh, but never that high, which is weird, right? Because usually we think higher wavelengths, we think really fast data speed. Uh, like, for example, 5 gigahertz by 5 Wi Fi is faster than 2.4 for various reasons. Uh, but with IR, it's just such an old technology and it's basically like Morse code uh, that all the stuff is really slow. Uh, and it's just like off and on, like, like, like it's, it's literally like almost ex the exact same thing, like fast Morse code. Oh, so here's a fun thing. Does anyone have their camera? Uh, okay, so I use uh, this one. It's on. I need someone to come up with their phone. Oh, that's fine. I'm, I'm almost. <laughs> uh, actually, the cheaper the better. So it's really nice. Uh, uh, so it turns out that the cheaper the better, the Oh, yeah. So, so good camera should not be able to perceive it because we're going to filter out the IR. Um, and 
don't know how much it takes for this. It looks expensive, but I don't need to take it so much. Okay, so apparently there's the an issue with the other, so I guess I'll have to turn on the other. I think it's because my microphone is coming out from my from my um from here. Oh, okay. So, so actually, yeah, let's let's change that to yeah. This one, right? Yeah. That's it. Uh, uh, hopefully, people can hear me better now. Can, can you? Yeah. yeah, don't worry. Yes, we are. I, I assure you, we are technology professionals. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we know what we're doing. Yes. Yes, yes. So you can use this on any TV remote, any IR remote. Uh, you turn your, your front facing camera or any cheap camera. Like I said, well, this will not work on a good camera, but on a cheap camera where they don't filter the IR and when it comes into the a sensor, you can actually see the lights turning on and off. And it comes in like kind of magenta, which you know is the problem. <laughs> so anyway, so I uh, Wait, now, oh. now, why do you pick the front camera? Because he tried the back camera. Too oh, well, that's that's probably because the back camera, it shouldn't work. So you do usually when you have a, a back camera, there's, you know, lenses and coatings, and it's supposed to block infrared light. So you, what you, why is that? Uh, you get a better image. Okay. Uh, the sensors can't distinguish between, mm -hmm. uh, you know, infrared and, and, you know, other types of uh, lights that we can see, but of course we as humans do. Mm -hmm. So we as humans normally would not see anything in infrared. Uh, so a good camera is going to filter that out or mm -hmm. a good lens fill. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have those lenses, you're using a cheap, you know, camera. And usually front facing cameras are better for this because they're cheaper. You'll, mm -hmm. you'll be able to see the light from the infrared uh, remote. Okay, so cool. So we saw that, that was awesome. Uh, am I still sharing my screen? I am. Uh, so yeah, so when you send data from the IR, like your IR remote, you're only sending a few bytes, literally like sometimes it's just four bytes and that's it. Um, and you need, of course, line of sight. IR is just like regular light. It'll bounce off walls. It won't go through anything. And of course, uh, remotes have been around forever. So you expect there to be like a standardization and everything. No, of course not. Every company has their own standards that they use and employ. And if you ever bought a universal remote control, you know how frustrating this is. We could have the universal like IR standards, but we don't. So you have like NEC, you have Sony, you have Sharp, Panasonic, all doing their own thing. Why? I don't know. <laughs> uh, but the most common you'll find in most electronics is NEC. Uh, that's the Nippon Electric Company. They made the TurboGrafx-16. Um, and, and essentially all it does is it sends out two bytes of an address and then one byte for a command. So if you've ever used like the Commodore 64, and you, and you just like poke an address. That's essentially all it's doing. It says, here's an address, here's a value. Boom, that's the command. Okay, so I made my own little uh, IR remotes. Uh, we can take a look at here. And um, we're gonna use the flipper to decode it. Uh, so I need another volunteer to come up. Oh, the oh. camera here, so. Perfect, perfect. perfect. So, okay, so we have a receiver here, and this is just a, essentially a light bulb that's gonna turn on. And, oh my goodness, this is a mess. By the way, I love these Velcro ties, they are amazing. Uh, don't let my current situation deter you from getting Velcro ties for all your cables. <laughs> I just need to detangle these. There we go, okay. Uh, so, like I said, this is a uh, receiver, and there's the little uh, IR receiver that we saw earlier connected to it. And when it receives the right command, it will turn on the light bulb. There we go. And now we have on this breadboard a remote control with a single button. If I push the button, the light will come on, hopefully. If I did not completely bork this up on the way here. Oh, there we go. Turned on. I will push the button. Oh, and the light turns on. Perfect. Uh, so I need a volunteer to decode this. Does anyone want to come up? Do some IR hacking? Kaz, come on up. Sure. 
Do I need to get up there? Or uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. You got to come up and you got to like introduce yourself. All right. Hi, my name is Kaz. I work with Caitlin on Amazon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so what I want to do is, so there's a function here called learn new remote. Can't okay. push the center button. The learn new remote button. Yep. Cool. Now we're going to learn this remote. So we're going to point it at the IR receiver. Okay. And then push the button. Okay. Oh. Oh. And what does it what does it say, Cass? It says A one three three seven C nine B sixty four. Right, and so we got it. That's the address. That's the address is thirteen thirty seven, obviously elite. And then the command is sixty four. Uh, so why don't you repeat it at the um, at this IR receiver? Okay. Turn on the light. There it works. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we, we not only decoded. Yeah, yes. 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 Uh, so the frequency of the IR is always the same, pretty much. IR is IR. So this is this is almost like visible light. Like I said, it's using an LED to transmit. It's not using an antenna. It's just blinking an LED. Uh, we'll get into antennas in a little bit. No, I mean, you yeah. mentioned the IR of that device. Right. That, but, because remember, you mentioned that each company has their own proprietary standard. Mm -hmm. So that, that not, not your device, right. but the other stuff. Uh, so the, the, flipper, the flipper will read the IR, and if it's a common standard like NEC or Panasonic, okay. it will decode it. In this case, I was using NEC. Okay. Address 1337. Oh, it decodes it and it learns that. Right, exactly. And then it can replay it. So um, I have an actual IR device here. Uh, let's see, where can we plug this in? Oh, that is not Apple. <laughs> we'll just unplug these, plug it into the power supply here. Okay, cool. We got lights and everything. Awesome. Bluetooth mode. It's righteous mode. I don't even know what that means, but it's awesome. Okay, so uh, now now this is running. Uh, there is there is a remote here as well. It runs uh, IR. Does anyone want to try uh, hacking this device? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah, come on up. Hi, Alex. <clears throat> Get back here. Exit. All right, you're going to push learn new remote. Okay, so maybe on the camera. Uh, yeah, uh, you're good. Yep. yeah, you're good. Learn new remote. Mm -hmm. uh, push the center button. This one. Yeah, there you go. Now push the on off uh, this one, the top button. Oh, it's true. Uh -huh. There you go. Okay. All right, and then zero, 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 uh -huh. and C. 045. Yep, so 45 is the command. Address is 00. Mm -hmm. Why don't you play it back at the Bluetooth device? Mode. So what do you do? The Red center three. button. Send. Center. Yep. So turn off again. There Ooh. you go. And you can learn all the commands on the remote and then use the flipper nice. to control any IR device. So this is a good mm -hmm. real world example of what you could use on a real device. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. Does it override the last um, command? I uh, mean, you know, yeah. you know, there's still a multiple um, decoding. Yeah, let's go over this together. So, so now can we make it work with the other one? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So we can, we can, if we learn a new remote, we can, for example, uh, record this button and then we can save it. And we can give it a name, but because we're lazy, we're just going to save. Oh. oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. All right. So now we can add a new function. And I'm going to turn off the lasers. So this is going to be the laser turn off uh, thing. Okay. So now we have two things in our remote and it's fully saved. So if I want to turn on the laser, I can select the laser turn on and the laser turns on or off. Or if I want to turn on the LEDs, LEDs turn on and off from the, flip, from the flipper. And you can save as many remotes as you want, as long as you have space. Yep. And like I said, it's, it's just, it's basically more stuff. So, awesome.
Okay. Oh, perfect. Yes, we are technology professionals, people. All right. <laughs> uh, we, we know how to use computers. All right. Uh, yeah, so we did the party lights. All right, now let's get into some real radio. So if you look at the flipper, you'll notice that there is a... Uh, um, uh, oh, go on. We have a question from... Oh, yes. Uh, I don't know if you want to check it. It's on the chat. Yeah, that, why don't I check the chat right now? Um, just joining, what would be your preferred method to capture the IR signal from a bound remote, from the bound remote? Well, you just need to use the special version of You already demonstrated it. Yeah, yeah. So anytime you can just, you know, get line of sight. I'm, the, other, the other thing, too, is, uh, so this setup here that I did with the, you know, breadboard and the Arduino, I mean, I have full control over the remote controls. So if I want to do a deep dive into an IR system, and this is what I would use. The flipper is really good for like very simple stuff, the standard stuff you find. Uh, but if you wanted to like develop your own protocol or if you were doing some really weird stuff, you'd, you'd probably want to just use a microcontroller. So. All right, so sub gigahertz radio, what is this? No way. Okay. Um, no, I'm back. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. So if you look on the on the flipper zero, there's a section called sub gigahertz radio, and this is real radio. So this is we're getting into the real like antennas going through the air, that kind of stuff, AM, FM, you know, decoding. So if you develop a device like a, a doorbell, and we'll get into those in a little bit, or any like a garage door opener. You can design your device to send out an RF signal, but only on certain frequencies. It just so happens that the Flipper Zero will listen on those frequencies um, and record those signals, maybe decode them, maybe not, but definitely do a replay attack. Uh, so in the US, uh, frequencies are like 310 to 318 megahertz. Usually we see it around 433 megahertz, uh, although sometimes you will see 915 or 925 megahertz. Um, and most of these signals are just simple AM or FM transmissions. Uh, so yeah, let's let's boot up uh, SDR here. So an SDR is a software-defined radio. Uh, that means that we are going to be looking at raw radio signals going into the computer. And I'm just going to set up this dipole here. By the way, yeah, so people can see. There we go. I'm just going to plug a little dipole into. Oh. Okay. See. Oh, Thank you. Yeah, this is very complicated setup. All right, so we're going to actually look at some of the uh, radio waves coming off of a, a little device that you can buy from the store. So we're going to plug this in. This is an air spy, by the way. I highly recommend these. They're a little bit more expensive than the $20 SDRs, but they do a fantastic job. So there we go. There we go. I'll have to steady. Okay, cool. I think. All right, this is some some heavy grade engineering right here. Exit. Uh, so we're gonna go back to the desktop. We're gonna open up SDR Sharp. Sharp. By the way, the demo gods are not gonna like today. <laughs> so uh, expect bad things to happen. Uh, so we're gonna go to. Oh, go away. Zoom. We're gonna go. We're gonna set the frequency to four hundred thirty-three megahertz. Three. Four, three, three. Uh, I'm going to turn down the audio. And we're going to switch to the Air Spy R2. Perfect. Play. There we go. So, what you're seeing is around 433 megahertz, and nothing's happening. Uh, this is just the, the noise floor in this room, which is actually really good. I wish I could do more radio stuff in here. Um, so here's a doorbell, a wireless doorbell. And I'm just going to ring the doorbell. There's no batteries in the doorbell itself. Oh, what's that? Oh, something just happened. 
Oh, what's that? It's a little to the right, so it's a little higher frequency. So 433, let's try 492. Yeah, 433.92 megahertz. Something's happening. Let's actually, let's take a listen. So it's in, I'll put into AM mode. This is going to be a little staticky. No, I don't actually hear anything. My audio is clearly off. No? Oh, well, if the audio works and the demo gods were not mad at me, we would actually hear some, some audio. This is what? 434. It's, it's 433.92 megahertz. So what we're seeing here, so um, if we look at this, this is a spectrogram. So if, if and actually this is a four-year transform. So these are frequencies lower than 433.92. These are frequencies higher. And then we're seeing where the signal strength is right here. So we do see that there's a signal coming from the doorbell. Uh, now, normally, if the doorbell had batteries, it would uh, ding dong. Yeah, let's uh, put some batteries in. A scientific term. Yeah. Yeah, it would ding dong. Oh, and this might be a little loud. Try it again. Ready? Yeah. All right, so let's hack the doorbell. <laughs> uh, let me check the batteries again so we don't constantly ding ourselves. So one way you could do this is if we, we have the SDR, right? Uh, so we could go into something called the Universal Radio Hacker. This is all. Uh, Universal Radio Hacker is great if you're lazy like me and don't want to write your own DSPs for everything you need to code. So we're just going to go and record a signal. Uh, we're going to record from the AirSpy R2. Oh, look at that. It's already set to 433.92 because it's such a common frequency for these devices. Uh, we'll just start recording. We'll record the signal. And it's done, so we'll stop. We'll save it to the desktop. Uh, let's see, desktop, that's good enough. Okay, save. Close out of this. And because this is awesome software, it's automatically going to load and try to decode the signal, which it already did. So actually, we'll uh, process this again. There we go. So it's decoded all the ones and zeros uh, that was sent out. Uh, in fact, we can look at the demodulated signal here. Zoom in. Sorry, let's can make this bigger. It's not really, apparently. There we go. Okay. Uh, so there we go. So we'll see what's happening is that we're seeing the same signals. And if you're familiar with digital electronics, this is like very familiar. Uh, this is because it's using amplitude modulation. We're sending out these square waves, and from those square waves, from the infrared, from the sorry, from the 433 megahertz radio wave, we're getting uh, data out. In fact, we can <coughs> analyze it over here and view it in hex, and we can repeat this to ring the doorbell. However, the flipper actually is easier, <laughs> so I need another volunteer. Who wants to come up? What do I do? Oh, yeah, okay. You're going to hold this? Yes. And uh, we're going to go in front of the camera here. And we're going to go to sub gigahertz. All right. And, it's, and we're on read. Okay. So I'm going to push read. Mm -hmm. And then I want you to push the button. So, okay, I'm push the button. Release it? Uh, no, keep pushing it. Now release. Try again. Release. There we go. Mm. It got it. So, okay. So hold on to this. Sure. Hold on to the flipper. Uh, I'm going to put the batteries back in. Uh, push the center button. This, this yep. right here? Uh -huh. Release it? Uh, yeah, push and release. Uh, quicker. Oh, let me see what's going on here. Uh, Oh, there we go. 
Sorry, I don't know why that was being weird. Mm -hmm. So push the right button. The, the right arrow? Right arrow, yep, percent. Release it? Yep, really quickly. One more time. Oh, 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 I think you pushed the wrong thing. Oh, sorry. That's no, okay. Right arrow, really quickly. Oh, why is that not? Oh, save. Sorry, push the center button really quickly. Oh. <laughs> center button really quickly. Oh, why is it not working? Do it again. Yep. Should be sending. Or oh, it has to be hard. I'll try one more time. So if this doesn't work, I'm going to teach people a little trick. Uh, we're going to go to read raw. I'm going to take out the battery. Um, when I tell you to push the button. The center button? Uh, push the center button. This one? Yeah. Oh, 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 right. Just push the center button and then let go. Oops. Uh, try again. Oh, uh, what's going on? Let me see. Oh, 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 it's on send. Uh, erase. Sorry about that. All right, push the center button. Just let go. It's picking up. Yeah, it's picking up. Now push it again. Okay, so point it, if we point it towards the camera, sorry. You'll see it got a signal at the beginning. Now we're going to push this, push the center button again. Mm. So what we did right there was a very basic replay attack. It recorded the 433 megahertz signal, and it's just it didn't even like do any recording. It just recorded this what was what it was seeing, and then replayed the WAV file back essentially. And we were able to get the remote, or sorry, the doorbell to ring. And this is a great way to annoy your neighbors, by the way. If you can, if they have a wireless doorbell, you can record their signals on like a Hack RF or your Flipper Zero, and you know, just two a.m. suddenly have neighbors have you know rings that of people that aren't there. So now, of course, if you're making a security device, you would use something like a rolling code and everything like that. I'm just kidding. So, uh, <laughs> so here we have. Uh, a locking mechanism for like drawers or windows. And the way this works is you would attach this to like a wall uh, or the inside of your desk and it's just a magnet. And at the other side here, there's a, something called a read switch, which if, the, if it sees a magnet nearby, it closes the switch um, and it can detect that the alarm is, is closed or the drawer is closed or the window is closed. So, um, and it has this, 433.92 megahertz remote for locking and unlocking the device. Uh, so the port. <laughs> so obviously, what we got to do, we'll put in some. So, and by the way, this is going to get very loud. I hate this thing. This is very loud, um, but I'll show you how this is supposed to work. So if we have a um, when it's when it's when the drawer is closed, we can then push the lock button. Push the lock button. Okay, it's that three beeps means it's locked. And if we were to move this away, it's going to be really loud and really annoying. All right, ready? One, two, three. Okay. All right. So we need to hack this. We need to hack this so it doesn't do that anymore. Uh, so actually, we'll keep the batteries out for now. Um, do we have another volunteer? Uh, yeah, come on up. So we're going to do the same thing again. Uh, and you're going to select read raw. OK, and then you're going to push the record button. And then push it again. All right, now we have a recording of the disarm button. Okay, now let's try this again. We're going to arm the arm the security device. Oops, I meant to do that. I was... okay, we're going to lock it. Replay it. Replay the unlock. Now it's unlocked. Thank you. <laughs> 
And by the way, there's no rolling codes. Normally the way you would get around this is you would have like rolling codes on your devices. Uh, this of course being the finest security device from China. Um, no matter how many times you lock it, you can just replay from the flipper and uh, send. And unlocks, so. No rolling codes, that's awesome. So, so the industrial line is much, much more sophisticated. They have rolling codes and other uh, Right, right. So it, yeah, so this this is a, an example of a security gone bad uh, <laughs> by our, our, fine, our fine friends at the, uh, you know, Chinese, um, you know, $5 Chinese lock company. So, uh, <laughs> so, but, but however, um, just because something has a rolling code doesn't mean you can't use the flipper to get around it. You, oh, yes. Uh, how many frequencies can the transmit? Good question. So one, it depends where you are. So like I said, different countries, different areas have different frequencies that it can transmit on. However, the flipper zero specifically can only transmit on around 310, around 433 megahertz and around 915 megahertz. That's it. So it doesn't have a full SDR, it has a little chip inside that, that does, you know, device stuff. Yes. So is that limitation only for transmitting or can it also receive both? But uh, so one, one lesson I really want people to take away here is that even though the flipper is like a really cool device, there is always something better for each individual task. So for 433 megahertz hacking, I highly recommend picking up one of these. This is a HackRF. It will uh, not only you know, do the same sort of recording we did, it will play back. It will work on all frequencies between like zero hertz and like six gigahertz. Uh, it does require, it, it is, it's not the best SDR to be honest, um, but you know, it'll, it'll do all the frequencies. Unlike the Flipper Zero, which is specifically for these kind of devices. Uh, yes. Um, how do you know which modulation you use? Like every time you're doing it, you don't the person. How do you know which modulation to use every time? All right. So the nice thing about a simple replay attack is you don't actually have to demodulate. Uh, so if we look back here at, um, we're going to go back to the camera. If we go back to the camera, what's happening is when we record a signal, all right, we're going to go to read raw. All right, we're going to record. Oops, I didn't realize the batteries are still in there. But all it's doing is it's picking up the raw radio waves and then playing it back. It doesn't matter if it's amplitude uh, modulated, frequency modulated, or phase modulated. It doesn't even know what it picked up. It's just going to play back what it heard, essentially. Uh, for if you actually want to decode it, uh, usually on these, these typical these kind of devices, it's always going to be either some sort of amplitude modulation or frequency modulation. Very simple. Once in a while, you'll come up with like phase modulation. Uh, that's very rare um, for these types of devices. Most, dev most digital devices you use will have a phase modulation, actually. Uh, but for these cheap devices, they, they're as cheap as possible. Uh, so if you go to like the Universal Radio Hacker, once again, uh, like I said, this tool is really great if you don't want to write your own DSP. Uh, because what will happen if we open up uh, what we recorded earlier? Uh, let's see what it is. It's on the desktop. Desktop? There we go. Uh, it actually automatically, yes, actually, it, it will automatically try to decode the signal for you. So if you're if you're really new or if you're lazy like me and you don't want to go through the process of figuring out what exactly uh, is going on uh, or make going to like Phoenix Radio and like do the processing, uh, if you want the raw like just bits and data, uh, Universal Radio Hacker is a good good first step for these kind of devices. Um, and it, like I said, it will select automatically. So it says here uh, the modulation is AFK or amplitude shift key. Um, you also have frequency shift key and uh, phase shift key. So, so that answer your question? Are these free? Yes, yes. Universal Radio Hacker is completely free, open source. You can download it from GitHub. And it's on all operating systems. Okay, so let me pull back up the presentation. 
Okay. Uh, oh yeah, so here's something that's really interesting. Uh, yeah, so Tesla recently, uh, it turned out that they're, to open their charge port, they use 433.92 megahertz, and they didn't use rolling codes. So <laughs> you can do the same thing to, to go into uh, the charging port of any Tesla vehicle, so. We call it Tesla outside, though. We yeah, can we, right? yes, we can totally <laughs> test that. We can, we can totally test that um, after, after the presentation. We should totally go outside. Okay. Yes. How do you know the different Tesla? It doesn't matter. It's the same. It's the same. They're all the same. So, so if there are two cars that next to each other. So I was driving up the 880 uh, to Oakland, and there was a truck full of brand new Teslas. I used my flipper on it. All of them open. <laughs> RFID, it is black magic. And I spent some time reverse engineering it, figuring out exactly how it works. And I'm going to demystify the whole thing because it's really stupidly simple. But it just seems like magic because you, you, you have a card and it has like no power source. You put it up to a like reader and just through the air, it magically like sends data out and like, what's going on? Oh, uh, so, so we go about Tesla outside actually. Right, right, right. Oh, right yeah. Uh, so we can either do it now or after the presentation. Uh, let, me, let me join the meeting with uh, with uh, my phone man. Do you want to do it right now? <laughs> yeah. does, does, do you have a flipper set up for it right now? Max has it. Okay, let's do it. Yeah. Let's, let's do, do it. it. Let's, let's do it. Let's do it. It's right there. We're going to have to join the camera. Before yeah. we uh, yeah. me, let me log in first. Okay. Oh, okay. Intermission time. <clears throat> Intermission while we get ready for the Tesla. <laughs> no, I like I like the I like it when things turn back to the rest. So it's gonna be either that one or the one under. So you're the one controlling your remote. Duh, I control my own flipper. I was wondering why this can't all right. So wait, the top or the bottom one? It's one or the other. So different different Teslas use different signals. Okay. But most of them respond to one or the other. We'll just try both. Yeah. And where did you get that signal in the first place to put in there? It's on the uh, I think the fifth. Okay. Uh, it's, also, <laughs> it's, it's also on GitHub. Yeah. yeah it's on GitHub. <laughs> 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 it's on GitHub. It's also, it's a really nice library on GitHub where for, with all the oh, IR yeah. commands. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's that. Uh, there's also, when I made that, I used the Arduino IR remote library. And you can basically a copy any remote on the market so like any protocol anything you can do just with an arduino and those little stupid ir receivers by the way by the way um once again chinese manufacturing and its finest uh if i can find it um here we go so i got these uh receivers came in a pack of six um can anyone see what's wrong with this one i don't know if anyone can see clearly anyway they put on the component backwards so like four components they had one job and it's on backwards <laughs> so yeah i know excellent quality control right there so are we are we still planning on going out and yeah we're ready i'm ready let's go uh, we're out of zone two, so. all right go have some teslas this is awesome <laughs> okay can you we're here, I had the video, and we're about to get my Tesla hacked. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Flipper Zero is going to hack the charge port. Okay. Um, okay. Can you uh, can you check if uh, the video is showing on on, on the oh, screen yeah. over there? It's not showing yet. Where's the charge port? Yeah. That's no, right here. Oh. Where is it? All right. Oh, so I just, um... Okay, I've got, I've got a, 
I've got a message primed and ready to fire. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Just waiting for so, his call. Oh. So, actually, don't worry. It's a good view. So, which, whose flipper are we using? Oh, okay, hold on. Urban switch. Okay. Do you know my call? Yeah. Who's coming? That's mine. Uh, uh, yeah. I've never yeah. seen this color. Oh, it's a vinyl wrap. Okay. It takes the paint job. Oh. Uh, Marco, let me see you. Okay, okay. Hold on. And how do I? I know, I know. Uh, that does. And how do I? All right, I think I'm just going to do this. All right, so. Yeah, I can see it. All right, cool. Oh, that's Ed Scar. Right, here we go. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> with the flipper, huh? Yeah, with the flipper. That's a little dark. <laughs> what is Eddie right there? What's the consequence of when they can't Wow, flipper zero. Yeah. Can, can I close it too? Easy as clicking a button. Well, it, I, it, you know what I want. What I do want to know is what what does the driver see when that happens? If anything, oh, like as if I'm in the car, right? Okay. In the car, does the car tell you anything? Because you're not near a port. Let's see. But the door yeah. opens. Okay, we'll check it out real quick. We'll close it and then send it again. Okay. Because I can't believe that this is this is that dumb that anybody can open it and you yeah. get no alert. Right. Well, I can't. Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> uh oh. Oh wow! My whole portal—it thinks I'm ready to charge. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. Uh, Elon, we need to work on this. It's <laughs> rolling codes. <laughs> so the question is, can you discharge it? <laughs> Put something in and awesome. take the. Uh, well, can we steal the power? <laughs> Yeah, that would be yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. Go ahead, guys. Final, final round. Go ahead. Yeah. All right, so this is how we roll. So, we yeah. said, yeah. 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 I mean, it's dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> Try it after we've done a few presentations. <laughs> <laughs> there is a coffee over there you guys want. Um, there is coffee, otherwise, oh, yeah. we can roll. Um, All right. I got it from him. Right, but they seem blue. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, they're true. I, I like them. Hey, when I turned off your sharing screen and camera, okay. so that we can just focus on. Oh, okay. That's fine. Did oh. you put malware on my system? Uh, obviously. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Okay, should be pretty good. Uh, to answer Shannon's question, would it open if the car was in motion? Uh, so far, I haven't seen it open when the car's in motion. That is definitely something we can test. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ready. I'm ready to do that. <laughs> We can trade right now. I love it. I love it when people brought their own devices for us to hack. That's so nice of you. <laughs> okay, so um, RFID. So this is the black magic stuff. This is the stuff that, like, how the hell does this work? You have you have a card. It's not powered. You hold it in a reader. Somehow, like, magically, data gets off it, and you're let in. Okay, what's going on? Um, and actually, before I, I change this, change slides, I do want to point out. Uh, that if you look at these cards really closely, there's some numbers here. If you're ever given a, a, a RFID card and there are numbers, write those down. Those are usually the codes to get into the building. Uh, it's right there for you to take. Oh, actually, can we get the access controls here? 
Oh, we absolutely could. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, not every access control is necessarily vulnerable, but uh, we can take a look. Yeah. Uh, so it shows the camera. Shows my camera. Let's see. Uh, it's the next thing that's okay. It's not the spotlight. Um, I think it's the spotlight. Oh, hold on. No, no, it's not that. Yeah, that that's fine, Kevin. Oh, yeah. I see my. I see the camera. There we go. screen. Another quick question: Is this similar to like the push to start cards too as well? Um. Push to start should have rolling codes. Uh, the, the push to start, I believe, uses long range RFID. Although I could be wrong, I haven't looked too deeply into it. Uh, there are types of RFID uh, that will work over longer range if the uh, transmitter is powered. Uh, however, we're just going to be looking at the unpowered types where you just push, you know, put your card over the over the reader and then something magically stuff. So, appears. Okay, so like I said, if you see numbers on the card, write those down. Um, those are yes. There is one question in the chat. In the chat, what, I mean, what was the hardware device you were using earlier to show the spectrum as the SDR oh, please? Oh yes, I'll show that. So I was using a uh, Air Spy. So this is one of my favorite SDRs. Um, it's receive only. Uh, and it basically has the same uh, frequency range as like those cheap RTL STRs, but I find it does a very good job of reducing noise. Um, and also you can get a little adapter um, in the back. And if you have a 10 megahertz a lab clock, uh, you can, uh, like a atomic clock, you can hook it up to the back here and get spot on signal reception. So you don't have to worry about signal drift. So this is the AirSpy R2, fantastic SDR, or UHF, VHF, and LN. All right, so, um, yeah, let's continue. All right, so what's going on? How does RFID work? Okay, so I need to move this out of the way so you can see how this works. Okay, so uh, if you have an RFID reader, this is we're looking at the 125 kilohertz time type, which is the low frequency RFID. Uh, which I believe are these. Yes. Um, so you would have a a reader, and you would put like a, a key or a bob on top, and it would read it. Um, and the way it works is that you have inside a little transmitter. And it's always transmitting at 125 kilohertz. Uh, connected to the connected to the transmitter is a little receiver filter thingy. Um, basically, what it's doing is that it's looking at the envelope of the power usage. So when there is something nearby, it's going to draw a little bit of power from the antenna, and that's going to change the shape of the sine wave uh, slightly. Um, and that's how it's getting back the data. Um, and Let's take a really quick look at how the RFID card or reader look, works. So this is what a typical dipole antenna looks like. Normally, this would actually be in a circle or like in a rectangle, but for simplicity's sake, we're just having a very simple dipole, and it receives this 125 kilohertz signal. That powers the device. That's all it needs, because um, it's getting like one or one or two volt, volts nearby. Uh, when it's like right on top of the transmitter, that's enough to power it up. There's some data and logic inside, usually some code. Um, and that's going to turn on and off the resistor. That resistor is going to bridge both sides of the transmitter. And every antenna can both receive and transmit. So what happens is it gets a 125 kilohertz signal. It sorts the, you know, sorts the antenna with the transistor. And you get uh, the same signal coming in, uh, causing it to emanate, causing what's called backscatter. And that's how it's able to power itself. So it, it, it uses the signal that comes in and it emanates the same thing away. Um, and so we can take a look inside. Uh, this is what, uh, what's inside here. Um, so I, I took this part, did a lot of analysis. 
So up here is where the um, input comes in. So it reads from the it reads from this antenna and transmits, uh, sends the signal through this. Um, it goes through these diodes. Uh, it goes into this tank circuit up here and goes into this chip. This chip basically handles everything. It's like a it's a single chip solution, and then the data comes out to the USB. And of course, there's a signal going out to this uh, antenna. Um, and if we look at the signal coming out of the antenna, it's uh, yeah, well, exactly 125 kilohertz stuff, uh, and it's 23.6 volts. So it's such a good amount of power going through it. RMS 8.3 volts. So uh, read me. Don't worry about RMS actually. Um, and if you look inside, like a little key fob, you'll see exactly what I was talking about, where you have two leads going into the little chip here. This little black, gooey chip, super cheap, one cent chip, um, and then this is the antenna around it. So it's acting as the dipole. That's another up close picture where you can more clearly see the the leads from the antennas coming in to that. And like I said, inside there's just a little transistor that will short the two leads together, which is how you get the backscatter. Anyway, let's let's see what's going on with with one of these RFID readers. Um, let me grab a cable man. So I'm gonna what this does is this works on very specific types of RFID uh, cards or readers, um, and then we'll act as like a keyboard. There we go, plug it in. All right, now it's ready to go. Um, and now I'm going to need, where did I put it? Uh, ah, here it is. Okay, so this is another SDR. Uh, we're obviously working a lot with radio. So we're using a lot of software to find radios. This is called an AirSpy HF. This will let us receive signals as low as 120, 135 kilohertz. Um, and attached to it is an RF probe. Now, these are highly technical devices. Uh, you usually get them in, in entire packs. And what you would usually use these for is that if you have, let's say, a, a circuit and you're submitting it to the FCC and you want to find out if like a certain trace is giving off too much electromagnetic radiation, you can run the probe along the trace and view all the RF spectrum. And, and, um, and of course, you know, these are highly specialized devices. Um, you know, you could, if you go onto Amazon, it's going to cost you all of like eight bucks to get a whole box of these. So, <laughs> so definitely worth your time. Or you can just make your own if you have some spare copper. Yeah. Yes. What is it called? Uh, RF probe. Oh. Yeah, radio frequency probe. So I have one of those probes attached to my um, AirSpy HF. Essentially, what I'm doing is I'm turning my SDR into a spectrum analyzer, and we're going to view the radio waves coming off of this speeder. So I'm going to plug this back in. So the, uh, the traceability test is for compliance? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. So when you uh, submit to the FCC, and if, and if you've ever seen a product that says, like, this is FCC approved, they've done this. They've taken these probes, they've gone throughout the device, and they've tried to figure it out where it's emitting a lot of RF spectrum. So we'll open up SDR Sharp again. SDR Sharp. Uh, we are running the AirSpy HF. Let me set that down there. We're going to turn off the audio. We're going to set this to uh, 135 kilohertz. So that's zero, one, three. Fine. All right, can I get a volunteer? Who wants to come up and probe we our We need a we need a program. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so I'll just hold that there. All right, I'm gonna start the I'm gonna start the start the HF. There we go. All right, now move the probe close to this and let's see what happens. 
Oh, there we go. You see that on the screen? Ooh, awesome. It's, yeah, it's like a heat map. Oh. Yeah, it's like a heat map. So we see around 125 kilohertz. There's a signal. Yeah, you can take a look for yourself. And if you get it really close, you can see exactly the signals yeah. that are coming out. And most of those, so so what you're seeing here is there's a main signal around 125, 135 kilohertz. Um, and then there are these sort of transient spikes because it's really hard to get a perfect sine wave. Uh, but you can always identify, oh, this is the big one right here. And then if we were to do the math, we'd find this is like a perfect multiple, you know, or something. Uh, and that's what we're seeing on these. Uh, so we can definitely see the arc going out. Now, here's the magic. Uh, one second. I'm going to give you something. So this is a key fob, a 125 or 135 kilohertz key fob. Yeah, it goes right through paper. Oh, my God. Stereo testing. Okay. So what, what I want you to do is I want you to hold the key fob on the other side of the probe, so on the top side of the probe, and move it towards the reader again. Let's see what happens. Oh. oh, no, get it really close. Get it really close. No, you can touch. Yeah. Whoa, what's going on? That's the backscatter. So when you have the, well, yeah, when you have the, when you have the key pop near the reader, it's just going wild. It is sending out all this backscatter. And I did not find anything online about how to decode this. Uh, however, <laughs> However, I figured it out. It took me like a day. <laughs> and we'll do that again. It works either side. Yeah, it works either side. Yeah. Oh, well, she's having too much fun. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but isn't that cool? You can, you can see what's going on. And this is what I really wanted to show everyone because it really takes the, the mystery out of, out of how these RFID readers work is that um, it's, it's taking in that sensor signal um, and then it's basically reflecting it back. And it's so dumb and so ridiculous it just backscatters all over the place but it is modulated and we can get data off of the off the device so will that work with the credit card uh that is nfc and yes uh so this is specifically 135 kilohertz uh our low frequency rfid and so that's only for like little tags like you would put this like if you were maintaining a warehouse and you just want to like tags on everything. And Does you just, it do those Apple tags? I don't know what uh, Apple tags are like for tracking, right? That's yeah. different. Mm -hmm. So RFID is normally like if you're in like a storage system, you know, and you have to keep track of like a thousand different products, you can just scan them and then, okay. yeah, it's just, they're very simple. Um, we'll get into uh, NFC, NFC in a little bit, but it's the same principle. Question, yes, can we block that with a sheet of metal? Let's try it. Uh, let's, I will, um, <laughs> let's, I'll put my phone in the way. That's a sheet of metal. We still see something. What if we put a, put this on top? Yeah, uh, it blocks actually, it blocks most of it, but this is a lot of layers. So yeah, slim it down, a bit. slim it down. Let's yeah, see. What do we have? Uh, this, we yeah, we need tin foil. Yeah. Uh, we could try using, yeah, we could try using this cord. Yeah, no, it's blocking it. If you go like on this side over here, yeah, no, it's blocking it. Is that something? Because this is such low. Yes. What is this? Oh, here we go. Oh, here you go. Let's try the RFID block. It doesn't work. Well, 
So keep in mind, this is for low frequencies. It might work better on NFC devices. Oh, were all these kind of cord? Are you sure? Yeah, that's what I guess. <laughs> oh, you guys are the Oh, no, it's coming through. We're getting oh, wow. Oh. Yeah. Oh, but they expect people would not use it this close. Somebody would have to, like, uh, you know, close. rub it on your <laughs> wallet. So there are, like, giants, yeah. um, like, RFID, like, transmitters, receivers that you can use to get stuff at a slightly larger distance. But these are unpowered, so you have to. So those signs. Yeah, they still have to be really close to you. Okay, so yeah. Yeah, you have to be this close to you. So there's credit card info. That could be done. Yeah, credit card info is in there. So yes, they, they buy like a garage door reader for the cards, and the garage door reader is yes. designed to work at like two so feet away. And then they what will Yeah, we'll, we'll do that in a second. That's pretty oh, cool. Okay. So they, they can get pretty far. Okay. I see. All right. Sorry. We're, we're having so much fun here, but we really do need to go. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Yes. All right. Good job. Thank you. I'll take a wallet. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Roger. Thank you. All right. So, so that took a little bit longer. Um, uh, than expected. Yeah, you're closer. Yeah. So, that, 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 so what what I did to decode it is I found out I um I added some leads to this and I was able to I was able to get into the decoding um circuit and I found that what it was doing is I thought initially it was it was just reflecting back on the main signal that's not what it's doing it's looking entirely at the backscatter so what you want to actually do is we're going to uh, stop recording or stop playing back we're going to set the Sample rate to something really low, like uh, 32 p. Yes, okay. There we go. I'm going to set the uh, set it to like nine kilohertz. Can't see. Uh, well, that looks actually. Let's go to um, so the center one right here. There we go. Uh, we're going to set to uh, raw IQ. Uh, we're going to center it. There we go. Okay. And then we will record. Um, let's see how we record. Record theme. Ah, there it is. Yeah. No, frequency manager. No. Nope. And three bars at the top left on the options. Here? Yeah? I think so. Yeah, it should be a record. Oh, I think we got one more. Yeah. Um, oh, anyway, so the signal's right there. Huh? <laughs> uh, if you put into, um, let's see, how would we record this? Uh, there is a way. What are you doing? No, we don't want to record the audio. We want to record the uh, IQ. So we have IF, not IF recorder, IQ recorder, USD, band plan, audio recorder, and yeah. No, where is it? This is this is obnoxious. Okay, the gods of demos have gotten this finally. Um, Zoom, audio, base. Oh, baseband, baseband. There we go. Stop. And it crashed. Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, all right, but yeah, what you do is you record, you record off the sideband, you load it up into Universal Radio Hacker, and you can get the data off. Or you can do something even simpler. 
uh, go to the flipper. Oops. Exit. 125 kilohertz RFID. We will then read. We will read. We will read. There we go. Okay. And it says here that it is, you know, a um, a card, and we can use it to to play back the um, play back what's on here onto that. Uh, anyway, let's continue. Okay, and so yeah, we got the backscatter. Uh, so yeah, when you're dealing with these low frequency RFID cards, you're usually going to come up with uh, hit box cards, which is the most common type, or EM 4100s, which are often found in like Eastern Europe. I've never seen them here in North America, but they're just all unencrypted. And usually it's written on the cards. Remember I said if you see a card and it has numbers on it, those numbers can probably be, are, are probably what's being read off the RFID reader. Um, so hit prox cards are really awesome. Uh, they have, they only store a few bytes. It's usually the facility code and the serial, serial sequence. So for example, at my apartment complex, the facility code is always the same. Uh, and the sequence number uh, goes up by one for every resident. So uh, when I moved in, I just I read the, I, I read the RFID from my key fob. Um, and then I was locked out of like stuff because it was COVID, but I wanted to check it out. So I just increased this, you know, decreased the sequence number since I was the newest one in. Um, and I just, you know, found one that belonged to like a manager or something. And I just got into all this stuff. <laughs> Number, right? Yeah, it was a lower number, just by a few. It was only like 50 lower than mine. And it's only like a 16-bit number or something. I mean, it's really, really insecure. Um, and the fact that this is a new building using it, I'm absolutely shocked. Uh, let's see if we have something in the chat. Uh, re re mean, the re reader reminds me of a Pi Zero. Yeah, it's it's not even a Pi Zero. It is, it is cheaper than that, I can assure you. Uh, all right, so... Um, and yeah, so the EM4100 stores 64 bits of data, <laughs> that's it. Uh, and the problem with that though, is that there's checksums at the end, check, check bits, CRC bits, whatever, uh, that makes it difficult to read in like a hex integer. So I don't like this. Um, and I sh would be remiss not to mention the T577 cards, which you can write to. So if you do see a key fob, and you're like, hey, I want to let someone into my building. You know, I can just give, I can copy the RFID, give it to Sam, he can come into my building. And so that's what they're doing. Yes. Okay. Um, and NFC is the same thing, except that it is, of course, at a much higher frequency. Uh, so NFCs, um, NFC communication, which is another aspect of the Flipper Zero, uh, runs, is two ways. So. What we saw earlier was that you put up a, a low frequency RFID tag near the reader and it just reads from the low frequency tag. With RFID, you get like a two way communication going, which is how you're able to do like payment processing and stuff like that. Um, it can store more information. And when I say more, that's a very relative term. We're talking like some of them hold like 100 bytes, some almost 500. I mean, like sometimes even 900 bytes. I mean, we're talking big, big time here. Um, and of course, it operates on the HF band. Uh, 13.56 megahertz. Uh, and most important to us is that it supports encryption, which is a, a, the bane of our existence, which I, I I have to say, this is what makes, this is where the flipper zero sort of fails is because so many of these things support encryption uh, that the flipper zero just can't handle it. Um, and so once again, this is what it looks like. You have a 13.56 uh, megahertz signal this time. Um, but then you read off of the lower, like 12.712 or 14.48 megahertz uh, coming from the uh, coming from the chip or the key fob or whatever you're reading, your phone, whatever. Uh, and this is a bit familiar. This is what's inside a uh, NFC reader. You got a big antenna built into the PCB, single chip solution, uh, same tank circuit you saw before. It's the exact same thing. It's just a different frequency. And of course, uh, NFC key fobs, same thing. Uh, the wires are slightly thicker, but the only difference, they'll have the, the leads going out. And it just, like I said, acts like a transistor. 
source the two wires, uh, and then it sends off back together. Um, and let's see, does anyone want to see what it looks like on 13 megahertz? Let's do that really quickly. Uh, since we can. Here we go. Let's see, reader. We'll quickly open up uh, the uh, SDR.net again. We'll go up to 13.56 megahertz. Play it won't crash. And once again, we're going to set this to 13. megahertz. megahertz. Central frequency. There we go. Uh, set this to the air supply HF on it. Oh, there we go. And we should see some stuff come up. Oh, there we go. Oh, so it's just the reader. Yeah, that's just the reader. So, so yeah, the frequency change. change. Thank you very much. Uh, 13. Point, what was it? Oh, five, six. Seven, uh, five, six. Five, six. And in fact, we can actually see the signal all the way over here. But yeah, it's pretty loud. This is this is actually much louder than the low frequency. Uh, but we also read from a much further away um, frequency. So if we saw earlier, uh, we're going to read at twelve point seven one two megahertz. So I'm going to get out a little RFID tag. So if you do this again, it's going to read it constantly. Thank you. Uh, not much happens between it being here and it's not being here. Uh, but if we go back to 12 point, is exactly right? 12.712, we should see the data from the NFC. Why is that true? Oh, oh, because it, it, it read in the number and it <laughs> redid my, um, so it reads in a number and acts as a um, keyboard. So it's just, it's just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Open notepad. There. Now we see what's going on. So we do see a signal there. If we take it away, the signal goes away. There's the signal. And that's that's what we're reading when we're reading the NFC. Is that little bit there? So it transmits, it extends the power on one frequency and then listens to the backscatter once again on a lower or higher frequency. And if you were to record that, put, in, put that into Universal Radio Hacker, we could get the data. Probably spent enough time. So let's do something more fun. Uh, so yeah, so there's common NFC formats you're going to come across a lot. The most common is MyPair, uh, that does support encryption and is used a lot in like getting into hotel rooms. That's Bart. And Bart, yeah, uh, as well as many transit systems uh, and NTAG, which is essentially the NFC version of RFID tags. Anyway, let's go hack Nintendo. Um, and because Nintendo's, of course, famously use Amiibos. <laughs> yes. So Nintendo's have these little like toys like things going on. And they're called Amiibos. And basically what it does is that there's these little figurines. And underneath the figurine is a little N tag um, NFC sticker, essentially. And it contains data 
but it's encrypted. Like I said, that's the thing about NFCs uh, is that, or the NFC format, is that a lot of stuff's encrypted. However, a few years ago, some hackers, much better than me, uh, got into the Nintendo 3DS and totally stole the, the keys. There was just right there on like every ROM that they were sending out that used Amiibos. So now uh, the keys are out there and we can totally just like make any Amiibo we want. Uh, but unfortunately, um, we cannot use the Flipper Zero. Flipper Zero is not powerful enough for this. So what we're gonna use instead is something called the Proxmark, which many of you may have seen before. Uh, so this is the Proxmark right here. And all right, let's pull up uh, a VM here. So we're going to close out of this. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, and by the way, you can see the numbers that it wrote when it read the tag. So hopefully when you do a uh, security system, you're not using un unencrypted uh, RFID tags. <laughs> All right, so we're going to open up. Uh, VMware workstation. We're going to plug in the Proxmark. Full screen. Let's see what's going on. That's why I tested this right before I, uh, uh, right before I left to make sure that the demo gods would not get me on this one, because this one I think is a lot of fun. So we're going to plug in the Proxmark, and it should connect to. The virtual machine. Okay, awesome. Go PM3. By the way, so what I did beforehand is I downloaded from GitHub the Proxmark 3 software. Whenever you use the Proxmark, download from GitHub. Don't use whatever nonsense that comes with your distro. Uh, you'll save a lot of time. There's a lot of stuff that you can only get off the GitHub, including the Amiibo hacking stuff. So we're going to go into the Proxmark 3. Okay, awesome. It works. So we're going to pick a, I have Smash Brothers ready to go. So we need a Smash Brothers Amiibo to test on. Uh, so I'm going to go into my downloads folder. Uh, Amiibo bins. By the way, uh, in this bins file I downloaded, you can see where the uh, key is that they were using. I'm not going to open it, lest we get uh, sanctioned by the um, uh, by the copyright norms. Um, but if we go into Super Smash Brothers, okay, we can pick a character. So I need a character that someone likes. Um, Kaz, I know you play. What's a good, <laughs> what's your favorite Smash Brothers character? Um, both. Is Cloud on there? Uh, Spider Pass 2. No. Go with Lucina then. Yeah. Oh, no, it's here. Cloud. Yeah. Cloud Player 1. Here it is. Okay, we'll go with that. We're going to pop that onto the desktop. I'm going to rename it something a little easier for us to work with. Yeah. This top. So, what we have to do first is change cloud.bin into a format that uh, the Proxmark will like. Uh, so if you go into the Proxmark directory, um, there's a tools directory. And what we're going to find is the PM3 on me bin to email.pl. It's just a, a Perl file that we're going to use to convert the bin file that we downloaded uh, into an email file. So we're going to run PM3. Okay. Me bin to EML, and we're just going to throw in the name of that bin file. Stop bin, and we're going to be we're going to have the output set to desktop uh, cloud EML. Uh, 
that does not look like a proper file format. Oh, that's not good. Um, let's try another bin file. We'll go with Lucina. It's IJK. There we go. This one works better. I can't believe something I randomly downloaded off the internet wasn't very good. There we go. Okay, so it generated an email file. It's on the desktop. And if you look at the bottom, it gave us the commands to run. Ooh, just right in Proxmark. So we are going to uh, run HF, MyFair, U, I forget what that stands for, uh, eload, dash F, and then the file loop that, that we just created. So let's copy all this. MyFair Ultra Lake. Hard. There we go. Okay. There we go. Ah, it's done. Okay. Oh, actually, that's not done. We need to type the email. There we go. Now it's done. And we're just going to copy this command. And this is just setting the uh, universal uh, ID that we're going to use for emulating. Now, Cass, come on up. Let's get your Lucina. <laughs> oh, where's my, uh, where's my switch? Oh, there it is. Thank you. So, like I said, uh, NFCs are encrypted, but if you have the keys, anything is possible. Okay, go into the Amoeba section. Okay. Uh, show the camera. Yeah. Well, I don't know how this is going to work because they, they can only go so far. It's still loading. It's still loading. Excellent. You know, I thought this would like go away. Oh, there we go. Yeah. I thought as soon as we got away from like CDs and stuff, we wouldn't have to deal with loading. Oh, I was so sorry. <laughs> no, um, no, it's in it's more. I mean, go. All right, let's get your amiibo. You're just gonna hold this uh, right here. There we go. You got your amiibo. Push A. <laughs> yeah, name name the Lucino that we just uh, just created. I don't know if can you can see? show the uh, screen. Here you go. Oh. Uh, no, we have to hold it to the touch. Okay. One more time. Yeah. Okay, ready? One more yeah. time. Uh, a couple of these, right? It's not new. Yeah, it can be finicky. Try working with this one. Bring it flat against the first part. One more time. Okay. Now it should be still working. Why is it not? The the wires actually sound good. Yeah. Here, uh, we'll restart this. Oops, yeah. 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 One more time. Okay, one more time. There we go, registering. Oh, oh. Oh, maybe we already got it. Because it, it went earlier. Maybe if we just go to like the fiber screen and we can tap it.
Well, just start this again. It seems to work once and then. Oh, it's it's emulator stuff. That's why. Yes. <laughs> All right, one more time. Register. It's failing for some reason. The gods. Of, the gods of us. The demo gods God just got us. Yeah. But we got to, we got halfway through, so. I swear this works. <laughs> There we got it. Woo. Lucina? Yeah, we got Lucina. Lucina. Okay, excellent. Yeah. All right, we made our just we just made our own uh, amiibo using the <laughs> anyway. That's that's the coolest NFC hack I can think of. <laughs> All right, so let's finish this up. I had a question. Yes. Um about NFC, I've got this clicker card here. Yeah. I just scanned it. It seems to be my fair. I, I feel like it's encrypted, right? It is encrypted. Um, and if they did it right, <laughs> they it. I, I had trouble. I looked at I looked at the clicker card a long time ago, and I had trouble mm -hmm. getting into it. If they did it right, it should be. Uh, they should be storing your data on the server. But right. there have been times when people have given out transit cards, and you can totally hack those to pieces. Uh, they'll store the, the, the data on the card, and even if you can't decrypt it, what people will do is they'll put up someone else's card to like read the value off of it. Like let's say there's one dollar in your card and like fifty dollars on another person's card. They'd read the other person's card, um, and then they would say add you know one dollar, and then they would put their card to read to write onto it, and then they would get you know the value that was on the other person's card. So uh, yeah, interesting. Can you do that on the fast track? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> I haven't checked it out. I mean, you would hope in Silicon Valley we have things, you know. Uh, but we, we can take a look at that after the presentation if you want to okay. look at the project mark on that. Yeah. Uh, so, anyways, there's a few other things you can do on the zipper, on the on the flipper zero, but that do not involve um, uh, uh, radio. Uh, so there's like a bad USB, so it can act like a keyboard and send commands. Uh, you know, pre-supply commands. There's GPIO pins, so you can you know run LEDs and stuff. Um, there's this is something weird. I've never seen this before, and I don't know where this has come from, but apparently it's a thing. There's a thing called an I button, and it uses like a one wire interface. And I've only seen these for like one wire used for things like measuring uh, sensors off like one wire to like a microcontroller. And apparently it's used for something I don't know what. I've never seen a, 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 an I button before, but apparently it supports it. Uh, if anyone has an I button, something I'd love to see it work. Uh, there's a command line interface. Uh, if you plug your Flipper Zero into the computer, you can open up a COM port, um, get a serial interface going. Um, and of course, there's Bluetooth if you want to connect your Flipper Zero to an app. But the Flipper Zero, as far as I know, does not actually have Bluetooth, which is kind of a disappointment. Yeah. Oh, it does. Okay. All right. Okay. I, okay. Never mind. So I've done that. Um, so, in conclusion, yeah. Uh, so, whenever the Flipper Zero does something, there's always something that will do something like better. So, we saw for like infrared, uh, you can get those little cheap infrared mic, uh, dongles you can put onto microcontrollers to get a really deep dive. But, you know, the Flipper Zero will do like basic stuff. That's cool. Uh, for sub gigahertz stuff. Yeah, so yeah, we, it can record signals from like, you know, um, a doorbell or a, you know, a Tesla, so not a Tesla thing. But if you actually like have things like rolling codes, or if you're doing more detailed signal analysis, you'll probably want to use like a hack RF, SDR, but for basic stuff, yeah, it's fine. Uh, for RFID or NFC, uh, just get a prox mark, like forget about the zipper, uh, the flipper, get a prox mark. They're awesome. As we saw, we got an amiibo. <laughs> Made our own amiibo, um, uh, but you know it combines all those things into one little package that you can carry in your pocket. So, yeah, good times. Anyway, there's plenty of, plenty of stuff to play around in here. So, keep hacking. <laughs> really quick, the uh, uh, what is called the uh, the bad USB. So. Oh, you want to look at the bad USB? Yeah. Come on up here. Come on, let's let's look at the bad USB. 
So I have a USB cable all ready to go. Um, awesome. So in case you didn't know, the uh, the bad the, the bad USB mo module came comes from the uh, uh what is it the the was the it rubber ducky? Yeah. No, the rubber ducky from Hack Five. So if you already know how you know, or previously if you use um, Hack Hack Five products like the uh, um, um, bash bunny or what was it the, the, the rubber, rubber ducky? Like rubber ducky. Sorry, yeah, I always get confused with those. Um, yeah, you basically can use it. So it is very simple. So I'll, I'll give it a shot. I get I get this presentation what. Um, Few weeks ago at the CTF, uh, you know, but I really wanted to show you guys. So, a second here. So, what it does is you can't play that. Oh, sorry. Here. Is, is it all ready to yeah. go? Or? I got it. Okay, okay gotcha. Yes. So, uh, right now, because she's she's using uh, VMware, we have to tell her where what we want it to run. So, we just go to the uh, connect to post. Uh, we don't want it to any virtual machine. Uh, and then, uh, all I have to do is run, and as you know, you can do multiple stuff. But uh, in this case, we're just gonna run the uh, the demo version of the Windows. So here it is. It will open a Notepad. It will start creating some stuff, and then it will start writing off the other two So it's basically pretending to be a keyboard, but you can use it to send in any command you want. So in this case, it opened Notepad and Jingle Clipper, but you know, we can have it download, I don't know, whatever, whatever we want. Yeah. So uh, I, and I'll run again, because you probably didn't see it. So here, it's going to open Notepad, then it's going to start writing everything. And again, uh, the, the scripts are going to be sort of on, on, the on the bottom of the screen. Uh, that's where you, you get all the, uh, the scripts. So you can just load them in here, and you know it's actually very useful if, if you're uh, in the IT industry and you're just running scripts, and, and you want a place to store it. You know, it's just probably it. I'm, I'm not saying it's a, a good idea. I'm just saying it's, it's might be useful. So, um, what else? Um, yeah, I think that's it. There's uh, also a demo for Mac, so um, uh, we showed that before uh, the Mac version, and that's it. So uh, with that. Caitlin, thank you so much. Again, we don't have a meetup set up yet for September or October. November, we're not going to have a meetup because we're going to do a conference. But September and October, we we uh, uh, we need to add uh, some meetups there. So if anyone is interested in showcase something, please send an email to. In fact, I'll put it right here. Um, so. Marco at Pacific Hackers, or I'll give you my business card. You know, so send me an email there and, and tell me what you want to present on. Uh, if you have a project, if you have a, you know, a competition or whatever, please let us know. Uh, again, uh, for the people who were not here earlier, we have t-shirts for sale to support the nonprofit. Uh, one for 25, two for 40. And uh, if not, you know, we can call it a day. Uh, any questions from the uh, the other side of the world? Uh, Rob, uh, anyone from? Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, know, you very much. The net. Well, they're saying thanks. Oh, there's, oh, oh, there's great, a question. Great presentation. What Thank kind of specific tactics, besides keeping a white meter light for a new device, could be used to protect Windows against bad USB on Windows? Yes, uh, so you actually can go into group policies and prevent uh, those types of attacks. It is a, 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 an obnoxious process, but you can do it. Um, uh, I can add into that. So if you also, if your company has, that's a group policy or settings in your local machine, but if you're in an enterprise, uh, you know, get an EDR solution and then they also have uh, uh, bad or USBs, uh, Policies there as well. Um, uh, the first part. So what do you do? You recommend you only allow certain USB devices. Potentially, or actually, will detect what type of uh, you know of keyboard it is, uh, and then you can go from there. Uh, also, it works with with behavior. So depending on what it's trying to type, you know, can go from there. I've I've also seen projects that look at the frequency of the keys being pressed. 
So if the keys are being pressed every, you know, one millisecond or every five milliseconds, it knows it must be a robot, and then it'll block it. Um, but that's easy to, you know, get around. Delay. Yeah, sad random place. So. I have a little piece of information about the I button. Yes, oh, please. So I want to know all about this. What a little device by Dallas the big hundred phones from Dallas. And uh, this had a little chip. It was uh, a Java card, uh, a good chip, like you have on the Java smart cards a year ago. You uh, could program it in a good one to K of something in Java. It runs a KVM, like a Java JVM, but so KVM is a smaller. Uh, and then it used the one wire protocol, which is sort of serial, but TX and RX are on the same wire. So okay. it's only like one wire. There's, of course, there's ground, so there's two wires. But uh, yeah, so you can program it. They were used to store a like, key or something. Not, not yeah. much water. Yeah, I've never seen them in the wild. Uh, but um, but the, the Flipper Zero was made in Eastern Europe. So there's a good chance that a lot of the a lot of the technologies that it focuses on are popular over there, <laughs> but not over here. There's only one place I ever see smart button in the wild. It's still used by security companies. Really? They'll they'll randomly stick it up on like the corner of a building, and they have if they have a guard who's on patrol, they want the guards to basically touch a thing to it to mark that they were at this point at that time, and that's basically how they keep track of where their guards have been to make sure that they control. Wow, that's interesting. interesting. And but I, I think security companies use that because they've been using it for like twenty plus years. Because I've seen, I saw it twenty years ago, and I still see, I still see them stuck in buildings occasionally. Oh, it looks so like somebody just randomly stuck a really large button cell battery on the side of the building. I've seen it in an apartment building. Oh, cool! You can find sometimes on eBay. Uh, it's very cheap. Yeah, that's a really collectible. It's a ring, like a bigger ring that has a time button on it. On it. Big job, I mean. And there are SDKs that you can find for them. Uh, there was one question about the airspike. Uh, the airspike. So, yeah, let's go to the airspike website. Right, okay. So, there's only like three models of airspike that you can, uh, you can get here. So, if we go to the airspike website, I can go to purchase. Uh, airspy.us is where I got mine. And the demo gods got us again. Airspy.us appears to be down or very slow. Oh, there we go. Okay. So if you go onto their products, uh, you'll see that there's uh, some STR receivers. And here we go. So there's like the STR Mini, which is sort of the competitor to like the RTL devices um, for 100. Uh, the one I have here, the AirSpy R2 is 170. Uh, and then the HF, this one right here, is another $170. But that one does the lower frequencies. So, yeah, SCRs can get really expensive when you start getting into the, to the, you know, really good ones. So the one that I really like is called the Blade RF. Um, and this is this is only if you're like getting into like signal processing and making your own uh, RF hardware. Uh, but uh, it goes all the way up to it has two transmit antennas, two receive antennas. You can turn it into a Wi-Fi hotspot. I kid you not. There's a um, there there is a FPGA on board, and you can actually turn your STR into a Wi-Fi hotspot, and they have the code to, to do it right here. Um, but it is a little expensive. So um, you go to the shop. Uh, we see that they start at about $540, go up to $780. And if you want to blast it off in the space and get a, you need a thermal <laughs> version, uh, it costs you like $1,600 or more. So. But they're awesome. I love those later. That's that's give you an idea about how how the AirSpy um, prices compared to the other professional SDR. All right, let's see. Any other questions? Yeah, I said the AirSpy that we used was the AirSpy R2 uh, for the 433, the sub gigahertz, and then the AirSpy HF 
for looking at the RFID system. Is the blader up expensive because of any hardware that's inside of it, or is it the software and all that? It's, it's entirely the hardware. Uh, like I said, so if we go back to the Blade RF uh, website, um, uh, there's a lot of RF engineering that goes on. So when you're designing RF devices, it's a little bit different than dividing than designing traditional like um, analog or digital devices because you have to be very particular about what's going what goes on in the entire signal path and there's a lot of signal paths uh, so you have to make sure that there's low noise being brought in because you have a lot of like amplifiers for example uh, you need to make sure that the timing circuits are you know going to be as precise as possible so you need something you can't just have a regular old uh, crystal oscillator you need some you at least need a temperature controlled or temperature compensated crystal oscillator um, and of course you need to keep in track of like impedances and stuff like that um, but if you look at the uh, image right here, you'll see that there's a giant FPGA um, right in the right in the center here, like cyclone. <laughs> and these things are really expensive. So you have a lot of expensive RF hardware uh, shielded, of course, and you have two receive signal paths, two transmit signal paths, um, and also a, a really expensive. Uh, FPGA that you're working with. So that's that's why it's so expensive. I mean, it really does cost that much. But you can, uh, SDRs are the radio equivalent of FPGAs in the digital world, if anyone's ever used those. And of course, this also has an FPGA, so it's like double as expensive. Where would they use these uh, expensive? So if, let's say you're doing, you're designing your own RF systems. Like you are designing a new product and you you want to like design a new Wi-Fi chip. Uh, you would actually get something like this. And like I said, you can actually load up the FPGA with software uh, that will turn this entire device yeah. into a Wi-Fi router um, that you have full control over. Um, you can also turn this into like, let's say you're developing a doorbell uh, and you want it to run on like 433 you know, 0. 0.19 megahertz, and you're, just, you're designing the circuitry, uh, that's where this would come in. So if you're doing RF design, uh, instead of building an RF circuit by hand, uh, you can use this to sort of simplify the process and do everything in software. But I, I wonder, like, would they use the uh, what, what, like, application they would use to develop? Um, so for... What application would use this kind of RF device? Uh, like, what, so... Um, so to program the FPGA, you're, you're going to use something like um, uh, like Xilinx or their software. Um, and then, but, but for radio programming, you would use something like uh, GNU Radio or Simulink and MATLAB. Um, and then uh, you can take those specs and, use, and implement that on a much cheaper solution if you're going to scale it up. Oh, I mean commercial application. I don't mean a software application. Like, like, where are these boards being used? commercially right so they, these are yeah these are used in development so if you are okay. developing a, oh, a new piece of hardware i see so yeah. prototypes yeah for prototyping okay. yeah or to make a web sdr for example like a web sdr uh, this is like way overkill <laughs> i mean it's awesome if you want to use this but um uh, like an air spy would be better for like a web sdr um but like i said if you're doing any like rf development you just yeah you gotta use something like this any other questions? All right. All right. Thank you. Yeah, that's it, guys. So thank you so much for coming. And yeah, we'll we'll see each other for the next month, and we'll we'll get a a new cool presentation like this. And if not submit your, you know, we want some input from you. So again. Please let us know what you want to hear, what you want to see, and, yeah. and we have I'll, I'll find the speakers. Just tell me. Yeah, we have plenty of stuff to play with up here, so. <laughs>